If anyone had prophesied four months ago that Tampa would be the site of a 1979 playoff game, a call would have gone out for the men in the white coats. But a thin line separates prophets from madmen. And last weekend, the Central Division champion Buccaneers put their Cinderella season on the line against the Philadelphia Eagles. The Eagles possessed experience and momentum, while the Bucs possessed an offense that has put a lot of people to sleep over the second half of the season. But when action commenced, the Eagles' defense was caught napping, though the running of number 42, Ricky Bell, was a real eye-opener. The Bucks' very first series was a portent of things to come, as Bell carried 11 times while over nine minutes of the clock was consumed. Bell's 11th carry of the drive gave Tampa Bay its first score. While Bell rarely stopped ringing, he was allowed an occasional breather. In the second quarter, Doug Williams found Jimmy Giles, number 88, in the end zone. But the touchdown was negated when officials ruled that the Bucks' tight end did not have possession of the ball before he went out of the end zone. The Bucks, however, did not wait long to get the touchdown back. On their very next series, Bell scored his second touchdown of the game. The Bucks' offensive revival was startling indeed, and it was complemented by the NFL's leading defense, which continued the kind of play that had carried Tampa Bay into the playoffs. Ron Jaworski usually found his receivers covered, and twice in the game, Jaworski was covered by Leroy Selman, number 63. Jaworski only managed 15 completions and 38 attempts for the day, and most of them were short ones, full of sound and fury, but signifying nothing. There was plenty of sound and fury in the vicinity of the Eagles' bench as well. One reason for Dick Vermeil's frustration was Jaworski's inability to hook up with Harold Carmichael, number 17. In the third quarter, however, Jaworski and the tall man relieved some of their coach's frustration with a 39-yard gain. play followed on the heels of a Jaworski touchdown pass to Charlie Smith, number 85, that had closed out the first half. Both passes suggested that the Eagles were back in business, but Tampa Bay had never gone out of business. Throughout the second half, Bell continued to reel off substantial chunks of yardage. The afternoon concluded with number 42 establishing a new playoff record by carrying the ball 38 times on his way to 142 yards rushing. Meanwhile, Williams maintained expert control over the Bucks' passing game. When he and Jimmy Giles again steered a course for the end zone, there was no doubt of the outcome. The 24 to 10 Tampa Bay lead looked insurmountable, but not to a Philadelphia team that had managed to strike the word quit from their vocabulary in 1979. With Jaworski and Carmichael again performing their patented heroics, the Eagles came within striking distance, and when they regained the ball with over two minutes remaining, they appeared intent on having the last word. But as it turned out, Tampa Bay's defense had the final say. The 24-17 Tampa Bay win supplied the hometown faithful with plenty to scream about. Only one more Sunday stands between the Bucks and an NFC championship something no one could have predicted before the season began, except perhaps for a madman.
It has been 14 long years since the San Diego Chargers were last in the playoffs. Now nearly a decade and a half later, the Houston Oilers were in sunny San Diego Stadium, minus the services of quarterback Dante Pastorini and NFL rushing leader Earl Campbell to challenge the reborn Chargers in round two of the AFC playoffs. After spotting San Diego's seven points, Houston, led by number 32, strong safety Vernon Perry, set out to make the Bolts' long-awaited return to the playoff scene a regrettable one. Perry would torment Charger quarterback Dan Fouts all day, and twice his heads-up interceptions short-circuited San Diego first-half drives. Perry's defensive expertise wasn't limited to blanketing pass coverage, for on a Charger field goal attempt, the ex-Canadian leaguer burst through to block the would-be three-pointer and return it 57 yards. With Campbell's sideline, many thought Houston's offense would have about the same punch as a low-tar cigarette. But determined efforts by Rob Carpenter, number 26, and reserve back Booby Clark, number 42, proved hazardous to San Diego's health. Clark's touchdown put Houston up 10 to 7 by halftime. But in the second half, the Chargers came out smoking as Surgeon General Dan Fouts operated on the Houston secondary. Tight end Bob Klein, who led all San Diego receivers with five catches in the game, aided Fouts' downfield surge. Lydell Mitchell, who rarely is given the opportunity to showcase his running skill because of San Diego's devastating passing attack, climaxed the drive. The Chargers took a 14-10 lead early into the third quarter, and it appeared as if reserve quarterback Gifford Nielsen would be unable to muster the crippled Oiler forces as a remarkable interception by cornerback Mike Williams closed the door on Houston. On the Chargers' next possession, however, Euler cornerback J.C. Wilson outperformed Williams by stealing one with one hand tied behind his back. Wilson's one-handed wonder gave Nielsen another chance to prove himself an able reserve. And with the help of Mike Renfro, number 82, he most assuredly did so. Renfro's 47-yard catch and elusive run made it 17 to 14 visitors. With a full quarter to play, the Dan Fouts aerial show sought to please those who had waited since the days of Keith Lincoln and Lance Allworth for a playoff win. Such a meaningful win was never to materialize, however, as Houston secondary, the NFL's interception leading unit, rose to the occasion. Again, the ringleader was number 32, Vernon Perry. To say that one man was responsible for Houston's 17 to 14 victory would be untrue. But consider this, Vernon Perry intercepted four passes. As well, he blocked a field goal. Of his five foster turnovers, two led to Oilers scores. Quite ironically, Perry caught as many Dan Fouts passes as did wide receiver John Jefferson. And his four thefts established a playoff interception record. For San Diego, they must wait for the 80s. For Houston, it's on to Pittsburgh for the AFC Championship game.
The dictionary definition of the word terrible reads causing prolonged or intense fear, which is precisely what the world champion Steelers do to playoff opponents in Three Rivers Stadium. It has been seven years since Larry Zonka and the Miami Dolphins met Pittsburgh in postseason play. In 1972, the Dolphins won 21 to 17 on their way to a perfect season. The Steelers aren't perfect this year, but they are as close as anyone has come. And this is the time of year when the money is on the table that the Steelers strike force arrives. While the Steelers are the most formidable team in the NFL, they have managed to turn the ball over 52 times, most in the league. Quarterback Terry Bradshaw gave the Dolphins secondary the opportunity to extend that figure, but free safety Neil Colsey, number 20, could not secure the ball. Pittsburgh capitalized, scoring on their first possession on a one-yard burst by number 38, Sidney Thornton. Miami could do nothing on their first possession, and the punishing Steelers came right back, eating up 62 yards on nine plays. Wide receiver John Stallworth, number 82, was a key figure in the Steeler attack, totaling six receptions for 86 yards on the day. From 17 yards out, Bradshaw hits Stallworth again, this time in heavy traffic. In a game of two-hand touch, Stallworth would have been down at the six-yard line. Instead, his ability to shed tacklers led to Pittsburgh's second touchdown. So, by the time the Dolphins had run three plays from scrimmage, the Steelers had a 13-to-nothing lead. With the Miami running game generating just seven total yards in the first half, quarterback Bob Greasy turned to his only option, the pass. This, too, was stifled by a Steelers secondary that gave no indication of feeling the loss of injured All-Pro linebacker Jack Ham. With less than a minute remaining in the first quarter, Terry Bradshaw looked like a man ready for a third helping of Christmas dinner. While Bradshaw scrambled, wide receiver Lynn Swan sought out some vacant ground in the end zone, collecting six more points for a 20 to nothing Steeler lead. Miami's running game showed little improvement in the second half. The monster that is the Pittsburgh defense went after Dolphin running back Gary Davis like desert rats with a kamikaze complex. With just 25 net yards on the ground all afternoon, Bob Greasy returned to the air, teaming with number 82, Duriel Harris, to bring the Dolphins within 13. After running back Rocky Blyer re-established Pittsburgh's 20-point margin with a one-yard touchdown plunge, the Miami secondary stiffened, reminding Steeler tight end Benny Cunningham that they still came to play football. The final Pittsburgh points were provided by the reliable number 32, Franco Harris, who scored his 15th touchdown in postseason play, an NFL record. This capped a 34-14 Steeler win. They next host the gutsy Houston Oilers to determine the AFC representative in the Super Bowl. 50,000 terrible towels and 45 hungry Steelers will be at Three Rivers to welcome them.
It was time once again for the traditional holiday season event in Dallas, an NFC playoff game. With the opponent being only the Los Angeles Rams, a team that Dallas had dominated throughout the decade. Cowboy faithful felt that some down-home Texas foot-stomping was to be the order of the day. But the strong Ram defense forced four Dallas punts and a Rodgers Staubach interception in the first 15 minutes. The shifting of the Cowboys' flex posed problems for the Ram offense, constantly forcing quarterback Vince Ferragamo out of the pocket in the early going. This safety was the only score in a dull but hard-hitting first period. Los Angeles's annual playoff failure has been attributed to the lack of a consistent offense. The unimaginative Ram attack was ignited somewhat when Vince Ferragamo replaced the injured Pat Hayden in midseason. The emergence of Ferragamo and running back Wendell Tyler, number 26, added punch to a lackluster offense. This combination teamed up to score the game's first touchdown as Tyler easily beat number 50 linebacker D.D. Lewis's man-on-man -man coverage to the ball and the end zone. After a quarter of six incompletions, Roger Staubach got on track, setting up a Dallas field goal with this strike to Billy Joe Dupree. Unlike past years, the Rams were not content to sit on their 7-5 lead. Throwing four consecutive times in the final minute, Ferragamo's final pass was brilliantly turned into a touchdown by an outmanned Ron Smith. Smith's super effort, resulting from a wide-open offensive strategy, sent the Rams into the locker room with a 14-5 advantage. As the second half began, the inexperienced Ferragamo resumed his attack on the Dallas secondary. Continually throwing into the heart of the cowboy zone, Ferragamo's luck changed abruptly. Dennis Thurman's interception awakened the lethargic Dallas offense. Counteracting the shotgun's failure to adjust to seven Ram defensive backs, Staubach threw on first down with greater success. This bullet to number 88, Drew Pearson, was followed by a Ron Springs one-yard burst that cut the Rams' lead to two. Following another Cowboy interception, Staubach went to his bread and butter man, Preston Pearson, number 26. The Rams had shut Pearson out in the first half, but the Dallas offense was now executing flawlessly. Reading the blitz by middle linebacker Jack Reynolds, number 64, Staubach hit Jay Saldi in the vacated area for a Cowboy touchdown and a 19-14 Dallas lead. The Cowboys had reasserted themselves. Tom Landry's sophisticated offense had quickly negated the innovative seven defensive back approach of Los Angeles. America's team was through monkeying around. Needing a touchdown, Vince Ferragamo had one chance to atone for his poor second half. With two minutes left, Ferragamo hit a streaking Billy Waddy across the middle for a shocking score and a 21-19 Ram lead. Los Angeles, after years of ineffectiveness, finally came up with the big offensive play. A second look at the game winner reveals that Ferragamo had virtually no room in the seam of the cowboy zone to hit Waddy. A case of throwing the perfect pass against good coverage. There was to be no cowboy miracle on this day. 
After years of Christmas flopping, the Rams danced to a different tune this time around. It was only fitting that the Rams, the whipping boys of the Cowboys for so long, conclusively ended Dallas's aura of NFC invincibility.